What's going on, my comrades? It's your boy, Frank and the Furious, bringing you some Hockey 101 knowledge for Milwaukee's introduction to the NHL. As you are now all devoted fans who would never, ever leave the team, you must learn the basics of hockey. And today, I am here to share my knowledge of the game to you so you can understand and enjoy the series, even if you are a newcomer to this sport. The sport of ice hockey was created in Canada around the mid-1800s as a new variation of its roots as a stick and ball sport. The main task of the sport is to score the most goals between your team and your opponent's team by putting the puck into the opposing goalie net. On a basic level, hockey is very easy to understand and enjoy as most of its rules are not very complicated and are easy to catch on to. Hockey would first begin its professional existence within the French-Canadian city of Montreal. Fun fact, the first hockey puck was just a frozen cow patty. So think about that the next time you go to McDonald's. Throughout the years, the sport of hockey has grown all over the world, becoming popular to Canada's neighbor down north in the United States and expanding across the pond to Europe and Asia as the Soviet Union popularized the sport. While the sport is still trying to gain a solid footing in southern climates, markets like Vegas, Carolina, and Tampa Bay have proved hockey can work in the south. There are many unique professional hockey leagues around the world, such as the Continental Hockey League, the KHL, the Swiss-based National League A, NLA, and many more. But the league we'll be talking mainly about today is the National Hockey League. In the NHL, there are three positions, forward, defense, and goaltending. Your forward core will be made up of three more specialized positions, center, left wing, and right wing. The centerman is the most important position on offense, as they are the one who will be driving the play. The centerman has to account for all these areas of the ice, whereas the wingers only account for their respective sides in most situations. The centerman is also one of is also the one to take faceoffs for the team. A faceoff is a method of beginning the play in which two opponents face each other and attempt to gain control of the puck dropped in between them. A faceoff will occur any time the play has been stopped, whether it's the beginning of a period, a goal has been scored, or the referee has blown the whistle. Back to the center position, Having a solid number one center is crucial for a team to be competitive and a contender to win because if the center is unable to drive the play well enough, it will hinder the winger's abilities to play at top performance as well. However, this does not mean the winger spot isn't as important or not to be thought of. Having good wingers to complement your center's strengths and weaknesses is key for good line chemistry. Let's use an example in the league currently. The amazing forward line of in Colorado of Miku Rottenen, Nathan McKinnon, and Gabriel Landeskog is very effective as the three players play different roles on the line. McKinnon is the talented playmaking center who drives the play. Rottenen has a complementary skill set to McKinnon as his good playmaking ability and very accurate shot works well, and Landeskog provides a big body power forward to crash the net and battle in the mucky areas of play to get the play going in their favor. Now, I was using the terms playmaker and power forward. There, uh, there are many styles within hockey, but NHL series narrow it down into a few understand, uh, understandable titles. That being playmaker, a sniper, a power forward, a two-way forward, a grinder, and an enforcer. What do these terms mean? A playmaker is simple. This player's goal is to make the plays needed to get a puck in the net. The playmaker is typically looking for a pass first. However, that does not mean they can't take the shot either. A playmaker can make opposing defense and goaltending make a coin flip decision on whether they will pass the puck or take the shot. Famous playmakers are Sidney Crosby, Connor McDavid, Austin Matthews, and Nathan McKinnon. A sniper is simple as well, as they are the reverse. The sniper has the main focus of scoring the goal. While they can typically pass as well, their shot is supposed to be deadly accurate and the team relies on it to get up on the board. Famous snipers would include Alexander Ovechkin, Patrick Laine, 
Phil Kessel, and Max Pacioretty. A power forward is a, has a bit more to it compared to a playmaker and sniper. A power forward is typically a player who is taller and stronger than most other players and is equally capable of throwing big hits and checks as they are to scoring goals and making plays. Power forwards will typically have a high amount of points and a high amount of penalty minutes as they are playing a physical game that can cross the line sometimes. Famous power forwards today include Matthew and Brady Kachuk, Gabriel Landeskog, Jamie Benn, and Pierre-Luc Dubois. While these three may be your big threats on offense, there is one more position you can still expect big offense out of. The two-way forward is a forward that is just as smart defensively as they are offensively. While most two-way forwards are not huge scoring threats, they still serve a vital purpose to the team for clutch goals and solid defense. Famous two-way forwards include Patrice Bergeron, Mark Stone, Alexander, Sasha, Barkov, and up-and-coming Canadians rookie Nick Suzuki. The final two positions serve a similar purpose with slight differences. The grinder is a forward who is more focused on defense rather than offense. These players are, will not play a lot during the night, but they serve crucial purposes on the penalty kill, shutting down a game and getting under the opponent's skin. Grinders will typically play with grit and intensity when, as they use big hits and stick checks to wear down the opponent and frustrate them, maybe even having a fight or two. A grinder who is mainly used to throw checks and fight opposing players is referred to as an enforcer. While the enforcer role has mainly died down in the recent era, the position was heavily used in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s. Popular enforcers slash grinders in today's game may include Ryan Reeves, William Carrier, Cal Clutterbuck, and Milan Lucic. Now, players can have multiple ways or their game can evolve throughout the years. For example, while Sidney Crosby is an amazing playmaker, he can play a two-way two forward style just as well and be key in defensive situations. Or when it comes to evolution, players like Sam Bennett were drafted very high in the draft and pictured to be an amazing offensive talent. However, the offensive talent never transferred to the NHL for Bennett. So, to stay in the league in an active role, Bennett evolved to be a gritty two-way forward who can still have a clutch goal every now and then. Not every player has to have a cut-and-dry role to the team. To oppose the incoming forwards, we have the defense group. Defensemen, while not as diverse as the forward group, are just as key for situations of scoring and preventing goals. To help score goals, an offensive defenseman is the way to go. While they may be listed as a player who should be preventing goals, offensive defensemen can sometimes act as a fourth forward in the play as they are very offensively talented. However, the offensive defenseman is a double-edged sword as they can make many lapses on defense and allow dangerous plays to happen because they are too focused on offense. Famous offensive defensemen in today's game may include Eric Carlson, Brett Burns, Chris Letang, and P.K. Subban. On the reverse, a defensive defenseman is the unsung hero for most teams as they solely play solid defense and don't make flashy goals or plays. Very rarely will this player take risky chan chances to continue the offensive pressure, rather opting for a solid defense to keep the opponent out of high danger areas and limiting their offensive momentum. Famous defensive defensemen in the game include Jacob Slavin, Brian Dumoulin, Adam Pellick, and Chris Tanov. In between these two positions, you have the most common player type for defensemen, the two-way defenseman. Two-way defensemen, like the two-way forwards, play a little bit of both with more of a preference to defense over offense, but the two-way defenseman is very capable of making the opposing team pay for underestimating their offensive talents. Famous two-way defensemen include Roman Yossi, John Carlson, Victor Hedman, and Seth Jones. Just like within the forward group, defensemen can also be enforcers, but defensemen typically play more minutes a night than forwards, so it's preferable to have them on the ice, not in the penalty box or being kicked from the game. In net, you have the goalie, 
The goalie's sole job is to pre prevent the puck from crossing the line into the net. Goalies will typically play the entire game unless the coach were to pull them or change goalies mid-game. Pulling a goalie results in your team being able to add a six skater on the ice to pressure for a goal. This typically happens if the team is down by a goal or two and there is only around two minutes left in the third period. Now that you know different player types, you will be able to understand line management during a game. To start it off, what is a line? A line is a group of three forwards that play together on the ice at the same time. The defensive version is called a pairing in which two defensemen are paired together. In a complete roster for game day, your team will most likely have 12 forwards, 6 defensemen, and 2 goalies. This creates 4 forward lines three defensive pairings, and a starting and backup goalie. Within your forwards, you will have what is called a top six and a bottom six. What this means is your top six are the two forward lines you play the most, as they are the most offensively talented than the other two. Your top six is where your goals and plays will uh, come from. However, they can still be solid defensively. On the other hand, you have your bottom six, which is a grittier and more defensively focused forward group. While they can still add goals to a game, they are more focused on the defensive aspect and shutting down the opponent in key situations. Some teams may implement a balanced third line in which they may add more offensive talent to the third line that may normally play in the top six, creating a top nine situation. Teams that employ this style are the Pittsburgh Penguins and the Toronto Maple Leafs. This is my preference as well when I play franchise mode. Looking at the defense, you have a top four and a top six. Your top four are the four defensemen you play the most each night and are typically more talented than your fifth and sixth defensemen. Having a good top six forward group and a top four defensive group is key to having a team being able to compete for a Stanley Cup. However, you need a good bottom six too have a legitimate chance to win it all because if other teams heavily pressure your top six, where will your goals come from? That's where you need to rely on depth. Depth is a term used for players not in the top six or even regulars in the NHL. While your game day roster may include 18 skaters and two goalies, you can also have three players on your major league roster as healthy scratches. A healthy scratch is a player who jumps in if the coach makes a roster change, if a player is playing poorly, or if a player gets injured and cannot play. However, every NHL team has a minor league team in the American Hockey League, the AHL for short, and they can also call up players from their AHL affiliates as long as they are under an NHL contract. Congratulations! You understand roster management for your team. But what are the rules of the game? To start it off, Hockey has three divisions of play called periods, with each period being 20 minutes each. At the end of all three periods, 60 minutes total, the team with the most goals wins. However, if the teams are tied, they will go to overtime, which in the regular season is a three-on-three -three players for five minutes, and in the playoffs, it is another 20-minute period. In overtime, the first goal scored wins it all so an overtime can be one second long or 19 minutes long. If the two teams still cannot score a goal in the regular season, they go to a shootout where a player gets the puck at center ice and attempts to score on the goalie one-on-one. -on -one. This will happen three times for each team if they are tied in shootout goals, then go into a sudden death. In the playoffs, the teams will go to a second overtime for 20 minutes and will continue until a goal has been scored. At the time of recording this, there was just a five overtime game between the Columbus Blue Jackets and Tampa Bay Lightning in which the Lightning won 3-2. The game lasted 150 minutes and 27 seconds, making it the fourth longest game in NHL history. Columbus goalie Jonas Corposalo made an NHL record of 85 out of 88 saves. This is the ice surface the game is played on. The five circles on the ice are the face-off circles, where the face-off occurs in the middle of them. 
The four red dots in the middle are also areas where face-offs can occur during stoppages of play. The blue half circle is called the goalie's crease. This is where the goalies play and the net is right behind them. On the left side is the defending zone for our team, as our goalie is playing on the left side. This is called the defensive zone. On the right side is the offensive zone, as that is where the opposing goalie is located and where we are trying to score. The red line in the middle is called the red line. This is used for icing, which I will get into later. The far too skinny red lines are called the goal lines, which are also used for icing. The two blue lines are called the blue lines, uh, are marked where the offensive and defensive zones end and are used for offsides, which I will also get into later. In between the two blue lines where the red line is, is called center ice or the neutral zone, either works. At the beginning of each period or when a goal has been scored, there will be a face-off in the center circle in the neutral zone to start the play. The play will flow until a goal is scored, the period ends, or the referee blows the whistle to stop the play. Why would the referee ever blow the whistle? Well, there are multiple reasons. The first may be an icing call. Icing is where a team passes or shoots the puck from behind the center ice red line to the opposing team's goal line before one of your players can beat the other team to the puck. Icing can be called off if the race is close or your player is closer to the puck than the opposing player. If an icing is called, the faceoff will occur in your defensive zone to restart the play. Another stoppage of play could be offsides, which involves the blue lines. In hockey, the puck or puck carrier must cross the blue line first into the offensive zone. If a player without the puck fully crosses the blue line before the puck slash puck carrier does, an offsides can be called when the puck carrier crosses the blue line or the player grabs the puck while still fully in the offensive zone. While an offsides is called, the faceoff will occur in one of the four red dots in center ice. If the referee thinks the offsides was intentional, then the faceoff will occur in one of the red dots closer to your defensive zone. Another reason the whistle can be blown is the puck going out of play or touching the netting behind the goalie. Wherever the puck went out of play is where the faceoff will occur. A big, a big potentially game-changing reason could be the referee calling a penalty. A penalty is an infraction committed by a player that results in the player going to the penalty box for a certain amount of time. There can be a minor penalty, which is 2 minutes, a double minor, which is 4 minutes, and a major penalty, which is 5 minutes. A game misconduct penalty is a major penalty, penalty where the player is also booted from the game due to an egregious hit or act. There are many penalties, so I cannot go into all of them, but I will have many common ones examples on screen. The team that loses the player to the penalty goes on the penalty kill, whereas the opposing team goes on the power play. If a goal is scored on the power play, the power play ends before the full two minutes is up, unless is it a five minute major, where it will continue to go on until all five minutes are up, no matter the goals. A team can be on the penalty kill, can legally ice the puck, and will not result in a stoppage of play. Also, a team is able to score while shorthanded, resulting in a shorthanded goal. The power play is where you have your most offensively talented players trying to make a push to score a goal. Teams will even play four forwards and one defenseman on the power play to try to maximize opportunity. Inversely, the, power or the penalty kill is where bottom six players shine as they are the more defensively focused ones. For reference, a good power play is typically above 20%, whereas a good penalty kill is typically above 80%. If a second player gets a penalty, it can become a 5 on 3 in which the power play can have a 2 man advantage. Adding any added penalty will just add more penalty time to the clock, so the smallest amount of players uh, can only ever be 3 plus the goalie. 
If the team on the power play takes a penalty, it becomes a 4 on 4 until the other team's penalty is over, resulting in them going on the power play for a limited time. During the game, you may see a player in intentionally run into the puck carrier. This is called a hit or a check. Checking is used to wear down the other team as if the players continue to be checked, they will be slowed down the longer they play typically. Checking is used by power forwards, players in the bottom six, and two-way and defensive defensemen. Players are also allowed to fight. A fight occurs where two opposing players remove their gloves and go one-on-one -on -one against each other. The fight will last as long as the referees typically allow it or if a player goes down and stays down. After the fight has occurred, both players will go to the penalty box for 5 minutes, but the play will still be a 5 on 5, not a 4 on 4. When the fighting penalty is up, both players will leave the box during the next stoppage of play. If a goal is scored and the team that was scored on believed there was an infraction on the play, the coach can challenge to have the goal removed. A goal can be called back for a multitude of reasons, but the main two reasons are goalie interference, where a player of the opposing team that scored impedes on the goalie's ability to make the save, and the play could have also been offsides and the officials missed it. If the coach's challenge succeeds, then the goal is removed. If it fails, the goal stands and the team that challenged will be given a two-minute minor penalty for delay of game. This is a relatively new rule, as coaches were abusing the challenging rule to give their players a rest during the late game if a goal was scored, when previously the team would only lose their timeout if they lost the challenge, when each team only has one timeout. In NHL 20, players have attributes that determine their play style, so we are going to go over all of them, as they are also good hockey terms for the real life game. The first for forwards is the carry versus dump bias. This means that when you have the puck and you are coming into the offensive zone, you have the choice to either carry the puck in and immediately pressure the defense and goalie, or you can dump the puck in and chase it into the mucky areas of play. Teams will carry the puck if they believe their offensive talent and skill can overwhelm the defense, or if they have a good opportunity such as a 2 on 1. On the reverse, the team may dump and chase the puck if they believe their offense does better in the mucky areas like on the boards to get the offense going. Up next is the cycle versus shoot style of play, which involves both forwards and defensemen. This is what the player decides to do with the puck while they're already in the offensive zone. The player has the option to take the shot on the net even if it's at an unpreferable angle or to pass or cycle the puck to a teammate in the efforts to get an excellent opportunity to score later. Next up is a confusing style, which is efficiency versus energy. This asks how you, how players will play through the game. If your players will play their hearts out, throw hits, sacrifice the body in the means of keeping a play alive, then they play with an energy style where they play their hearts out every night. On the flip side, a player who plays an efficiency style may pick and choose their battle where it is favorable to them to conserve energy for the long game. The next style is simple, as it is to block or not to block. This means in their defensive zone, the player makes the decision on whether they will block the shot from an opponent. The pros to blocking a shot is to prevent the puck from even going on net, making the goalie's night easier. The cons is, is that is it easier to get injured while blocking a shot. Teams like the Columbus Blue Jackets and the New York Islanders are teams that attempt to block a lot of shots, as their coaches of John Tortorella and Barry Trotz are known to coach teams in the style of blocking shots. Now, for defensemen, the only one we need to get into is the hold line versus pinch decision. Let's say the puck is right here, in your offensive zone but it is near the blue line and there is an opponent right here. The defenseman has the option of whether to pinch, which means to choke up on the, on the puck in the attempt to keep it in the offensive zone, 
or to hold the line, which means to move back, preparing for the opponent to take the puck and move into the neutral zone and then the offensive zone. An offensive defenseman is more likely to pinch to keep the play going, whereas a defensive defenseman is more likely to hold the line in preparation of defense. Pinching is a lot more riskier than holding the line as if a pinch fails, it can lead to a dangerous two-on-one, a one-on-no-one, and a uh, two-on-no-one situation, which can most likely result into a goal the going other way. Since we already went over cycle versus shoot, we don't need to again. Congratulations again. You can understand the basics of watching uh, the hockey game. If you are not interested in the management side of the sport, then this is a good stopping point for you. However, if you are, stay tuned. For a team, there are two possible ways to acquire players. Trading for a player and signing a player. Teams are allowed to trade with each other with little restrictions. Teams can trade players they have under contract. Players they have the rights to, such, such as players they have drafted that have not signed yet, and draft picks. We will get into the draft in a little. In trades, teams can also retain salary, which th means they may keep some of the player's contract on the payroll to help the other team stay under the cap in return receiving more back. We will also get into the salary cap later. Trades are pretty simple but can be complicated with draft picks. In the NHL, but not in the EA games, trades can make a draft pick conditional which means the team will acquire the draft pick only if its condition is satisfied. For example, I am the GM of the Anaheim Ducks and the New Jersey Devils may want to trade for my defenseman Cam Fowler, but I want a first round pick for him. New Jersey is scared if their first round pick becomes a very high pick in the draft, so they put a condition on it. The condition is, the New Jersey Devils will keep their 2020 first round draft pick if the pick is top three overall, and the 2021 first round draft pick will be traded instead. If I agree to this, and Cam Fowler is traded to New Jersey, but they finish low in the standings and get the second overall pick, then I will receive their 2021 first overall pick no matter what. In the NHL games, you cannot put conditions on picks, but I wanted to go over this nonetheless. There are certain times where teams cannot make trades for certain reasons. The first is the trade deadline. This is the date nearing the end of the season that marks when the last trades for playoff eligible players can occur. Typically, this day is the last week of March or last week of February, first week of March in the regular season schedule. However, trades can occur post trade deadline, but the players traded are not allowed to participate in the playoffs if a team makes it. In NHL 20, you cannot make trades after the deadline no matter what. The second time you can make trades is during the re-sign phase, which is between the draft and free agency. Or my bad, is the uh, second time you cannot make trades. Uh, but yes, which is uh, during the re-sign phase, which is typically between the draft and free agency start date, which is normally July 1st. Trades can occur at any other time of the season. If a player is a free agent, meaning they are not under contract with any other NHL team, then they are able to sign with any NHL team. There are two types of free agents, an unrestricted free agent, UFA, and a restricted free agent, RFA. A UFA can sign with any team with nothing else added. An RFA is more complicated as the team that has the RFA's rights can receive compensation. A player is an RFA if they have limited experience in the NHL and are younger than 27. The limited experience in the NHL would be 7 years of professional hockey. An RFA can be qualified by a team to retain their rights, but they can also discuss a contract with other teams. If a qualified RFA signs a contract with another team, then the team holding the RFA's rights can receive compensation through draft picks depending on the contract amount. The team holding the rights will then have 7 days to decide whether they will match the contract or keep the player for the amount and length he signed for 
with the other team or can decline to match and opt to receive the compensation of draft picks instead. Mentioned before was the NHL draft. This is how teams will normally acquire prospects and young players. The players eligible to be drafted must be 18 years old on or before September 15th and not older than 20 before December 31st. Any player older can be signed as a UFA. There are seven rounds to the draft and each team has one pick in each round assigned to the team. However, teams are able to trade picks, so a team could draft four times in the draft or they could draft 10 times in the draft, depending on how many picks they have traded away or acquired. Trades can also occur during the draft, even trading picks from the same draft. After the draft is over, the re-sign phase begins. This is the last period a team can re-sign their players before other teams can sign them. Players you just drafted do not have to be signed immediately. They will typically have their rights for three years until they can become a UFA. In the NHL, there is a system called the salary cap. What does this mean? It means during a season, a team can only spend as much as the salary cap allows. For example, if the salary cap is $80 million, no team in the league can spend more than $80 million on their roster or else they will have to bury contracts or trade players to get under the cap. This system prevents large market teams such as Toronto, Montreal, or Chicago who bring in a lot of money to have a hyper, uh, hyper expensive roster and attempts to buy their way to a Stanley Cup, allowing smaller market teams to compete against them and be able to sign and pay all-star players with no issue. That is all I believe you need to know to understand and properly enjoy this series and hockey as a whole. I would like to thank you for watching and stay tuned for the next few days for the Milwaukee Dreadnoughts to hit the ice. But above all else, stay cute, my comrades.